Hey, we're back. We're live on a given Thursday. <laughs> I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech. This is Global Connections. And we are connected with Carlos Suarez, uh, who is our international relations host um, in Puebla, uh, Mexico. Uh, he runs the uh, international relations department at the University of the Americas there. Uh, welcome back to your show, Carlos. Welcome, Jay. Great to connect, and uh, yeah, look forward to just updating on some well, what's happening in the world. We live in different times as we, we connect every so often, and uh, perhaps the most recent uh, thing playing out a uh, visit that President Trump just made to London for the NATO summit mm -hmm. uh, once again. And uh, I don't know, you know, maybe we'll weave in some other uh, developments, but uh, most recently that's been on the stay here, and uh, you know, usually. President, especially now facing the domestic uh, crisis at home with the impeachment, uh, you know, it would be a welcome break to get out and see the world. Uh, but this trip uh, has been a bit awkward and, and, and you know, underscoring both the uh, you know, delicate situation with the allies over there, the crisis over NATO, uh, but even just some of the personal, you know, dynamics of, uh, of, of what plays out there. I mean, the uh, dynamics may be a euphemism in this circumstance. Uh, <laughs> Anyway, I, I just want to say that we've, we're going to call this show, we are calling the show, President Trump in Europe, New Wine in Old Bottles, and we're going to talk about President Trump's recent travel to the NATO summit in London. P.S., um, there was an article in the New York Times, I think, this morning, uh, itemizing all of Trump's travels to Europe and how, in each case, he has stumbled and bumbled and had gaffes, political and diplomatic gaffes with the leaders of Europe, trip after trip. So this trip would be no exception, eh? Yeah, that's right. Uh, yeah, that's right. And, and, you know, and yet, of course, a couple of awkward moments. On one hand, uh, there was some uh, video release of several of the world leaders, uh, Trudeau and Macron and, and Boris Johnson, uh, in what, what appears to be laughing and maybe mocking the president because of his, his late arrival to an earlier meeting. Um, beyond that, just a tense, tense uh, press conference with uh, the French president, uh, and underscoring I guess, just some of the awkwardness. And, and you know, we have to also emphasize, though, that Trump's behavior, while we can, you know, criticize it and mock it, and, and it does get ridiculed. I mean, uh, there are those, the press supporters of there who see it, well, he's taking things up. He doesn't live by the same rules, and and so you know, nothing to be alarmed about. No big surprise. But at the end of the day, we've now had, as you mentioned, several, you know, number of visits now, and in almost every case, something is awkward or goes wrong. Issues of basic protocol, issues of, uh, you know, just very complex issues that, that he seems to not fully understand. Um, and you know, the irony is that for, you know, for a presidential candidate, and then in his early days, he spoke about not wanting to be. Uh, laughed at, and he's going to make that go away. Well, the reality is today, in fact, he has been ridiculed and laughed at, and um, and you know, uh, it just it, clearly he's not in his element when he's in these multilateral forums. Uh, he prefers the one-on-one, -on -one, and even when he's there, he meets with the, uh, the leader of Turkey, the you know uh, Erdogan, uh, while the rest of them are shunning him more. So it is it is a tough time, and and you know the leader goes there, the U.S. Um, and is not. You know, in the, I guess I want to say he's not taken as seriously, maybe by some, and yet they have to because he, he's coming and making some serious threats and and, and otherwise, um, you know, uh, underscoring. I mean, that the U.S. is a big power, and, and whether it acts or doesn't act or how it acts uh, has a profound impact on. on well, let's issues. let's try to unpack it a little bit in terms of what what his motivations are and his weaknesses are that leads him to do this. I, you know, the first thing and we talked about this before the show is. Uh, uh, Marquis de Lafayette, back when, was a, a, an important factor uh, in our American Revolution. Um, and he worked with Ben Franklin to finance the revolution with French money. And so they were there at the very outset, and they were supporting us, and you know, we, we have a debt of gratitude for that. They also remember they were also part of the Louisiana Purchase in, I want to say, 1819. Uh, and it just shows you they were large. Uh, they were a large player in, in the world in those days, and we we went and uh, and bought the Louisiana Purchase for them. Uh, our country would not be the same if we had not been able to do that. I, I don't know how uh, you know. There's 
I don't think that they've stayed as prominent uh, on our radar as, as they were, but they certainly have been a friend of the United States in World War I, World War II, um, and now here we are, and in NATO all these years. But now he, we have the president going over there. He doesn't know not to, not to call uh, the leader of, the, of, of, of France, the premier of France, uh, two-faced, which is what he called Macron a, a day or two ago. Um, I, you know, what, what do you attribute that? He's, he's, it, it can't be because he understands diplomatic relations. It must be something yeah, having know. to do with, with his own, you know, mm, what do you want to call it? Attitudinal weakness. What makes him yeah. so oblivious to foreign relations with an ally of 200 and some odd years? Yeah, well, it, it's a tough one to, to, to wrap around. I mean, there are many aspects. On one hand, um, you know, there are basic elements of diplomatic protocol that are, you know, pretty widespread norms over the years. And, and you know, the French have a particular negotiating style themselves, which really draws on understanding and doing your homework, having, you know, having a pretty clear and, and, and detailed understanding of it. So my point there is that they would know and understand that history. And any, you know, any president should or should have a briefer that explains them, hey, we have a, you know, a long time, you know, ally, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and the American negotiator, I mean, in many ways, Trump does reveal traits that are typical of, of American negotiators. Uh, part of it is a business-like negotiator. He comes from the business world. So those elements, for him, it's all about a transaction, you know. And he's been harping, particularly on NATO, about the, the percentage of, of, uh, of you know, budgets that are being allocated by different countries. Uh, and, you know, he would argue, and then maybe again, those who defend and support him would say, he's been pushing uh, European countries to contribute more. Uh, but, okay, that, that's fair enough. Uh, but, but to then say that we've been getting ripped off or that somehow you can just you can't see it as something that you just put a monetary value on because the United States helped establish the world order after World War II and helped to establish the NATO alliance in 1949, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But somehow this style is to have no, no uh, awareness of, of what happened before. Like it's all here and now, and it's all a transaction. Um, you know, there's a certain moralistic negotiator that comes out of the U.S. at times. We don't see that in Trump, but sometimes, you know, promoting democracy or, or representing ideals, you know, we don't see that. Um, there's a legalistic negotiator that's typical of the U.S. Maybe there's aspects of that, but here again, uh, you know, the diplomacy requires nuance. It requires, you know, working to find common interests. In the end, uh, a final trait that's typical of Americans, and we see this very clearly in Trump, is the superpower of the bully. Uh, the U.S. has always been a powerful and at times, you know, uh, uh, asymmetrical power. But under Bush, uh, I'm sorry, under Bush, under Trump, he's taken it to a new level in terms of the bullying uh, because, you know, calling people names that are simply not appropriate or, you know, even a previous visit he made to England, uh, the U.K., where he said that the NHS, their National Health Service, was basically on the table. Everything's on the table. Well, that didn't go so well there. And now he's backtracking and, you know, saying, no, that that's not really an issue. Uh, I don't know. I mean, it, here's a president who himself has told us he doesn't do a lot of preparation. He wings it. He looks, you know, goes to visit with the, the summit of Kim Jong Un and just looks him in the eye. He likes him. Uh, the reality is, what he doesn't like is these forums where he is not the one in charge or he's the one that you know, he's, he's higher than everyone else is. Uh, and for the Europeans and the NATO allies, it's all about multilateralism. It's all about you know coming together for a common interest and. Having differences, but working it out, that's not his cup of tea. Uh, obviously, he's uncomfortable in those settings, and, and we see it again with his most recent visit. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, it, it strikes me, too, that France is where modern um, diplomacy was invented. I say modern, I mean over the past 500 years. I mean, Fran yeah, French is a diplomatic language used universally for diplomacy. <clears throat> and the, and yeah, the French yeah. culture is, is a milieu. See, even there, a French word, a milieu for diplomatic mm -hmm. relations. And so when you, yeah, when, yeah. You, when, you, uh, when you when you have a, a confrontation with the premier of France and you call him names and you call him two-faced, which is really sort of a universal insult, um, you're, really, you're really a bull in a china shop. And, uh, you know, my, yeah. my reaction, and I, I want to ask you about this, is, the French people understand what I've just said. They understand that France is universal language and culture, 
uh, for diplomatic relations. So how do they feel about this? And I and that's a loaded question in the sense that yeah. immediately after Trump did that, uh, there were protests all over France about unrelated issues, about economics. Yeah. But this seems to me uh, an aggravating point about the relationship of Macron and the French people. And it, uh, for that reason, as, as Trump does so often, he, dis di di he disrupts things. He's the great disruptor. And he disrupted, yeah, here yeah. in this case, he disrupted A, U.S. relations with, with, with France, and also the relations of the premier of France with the people of France. What's your comment on that, Carlos? Yeah, I mean, you know, it is hard to, to, to somehow connect and link everything, but it is somehow we together. The protests were already in, in place, and, and, and moving forward, and then Macron has lost popularity and popularity in France. But again, maybe just going back to your initial point, and that is uh, what we see in the style of, of diplomacy of Trump represents a, obviously a very sharp, sharp contrast to the centuries of traditionalism and protocol that the French have. Uh, the French, if anything, they, they have developed over the years this, this uh, style of negotiating, particularly diplomatic, where it's very logical, it's a very clearly thought out, uh, and there's a very clear understanding of what is their interest, uh, what is France's interest, interest. And maybe what I want to get at from the U.S., we often have a, an agenda or a strategy. But with Trump, we, what we see instead is just more this ad hoc impulsiveness. And, you know, even as he arrived there, uh, I think uh, I was hearing the reports, he spent about an hour plus in these sort of open ended uh, press conferences, but rambling, as he has done often incoherently about different things without any clear, clear understanding. And I think from the French, uh, certainly from the French elite, as European elite in general, I mean, he is he's simply a, an embarrassment. He doesn't know, he doesn't do his homework, doesn't know how to handle himself. Uh, and it just reinforces a, an anti-Americanism, which is very pervasive, very strong in France. Uh, it is some other places in Latin America, we often talked about it. But uh, this doesn't help, uh, you know, well, it just reinforces that. Uh, uh, beyond that, I'm a hard pressed to think. Uh, I mean, because the, 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 the summit took place in London, so he wasn't on the ground in France in any immediate way that might have been more pronounced. Uh, but, uh, you know, the, the chat that he had with Macron, I think, also reveals Macron himself is shifting his approach. The first you know, year or so in office, he was pretty low key, and now he seems to be getting a more aggressive, even pushing back on the U.S. Uh, but I'm not sure. You know, he, he's facing a lot of his own domestic constraints. And, um, yeah, I don't know that this. I don't know that we can say that this really affected those dynamics much because um, you know there's a lot of protest movement. As I was seeing the latest one in France, it has to do with a variety of different you know, things, the pension reforms in particular, and uh, you know France again, a, a nation famous for its for its uh, protest movement uh, since, uh, since the revolutionary days. Uh, but that's just more of the same. Although this one is very serious, uh, transportation uh, has come to a halt, and uh, many are looking at it as probably the worst since at least the mid '90s, when they also had a pretty massive strike. But back to Trump. I mean, again, it just underscores that he, on one hand, he's not comfortable in these settings, and normally, when you've got this crisis like back home, you know, this would be a chance to get away from it all. But instead, he had to come racing back, only to arrive and have, you know, the, the Speaker of the House announcing, you know, that impeachment uh, articles moving forward, um, and, uh, you know, it, it can't be a good or easy time for him at all. Yeah, look, well, looking at it from Macron's side, um, you know, there's, there's really a, a couple of issues here. One is NATO. Uh, France yeah. has been a, a, a loyal uh, participant in the, not only the EU, but in, uh, in NATO. The EU is, um, in some ways, unraveling these days, and, and Trump has not been helpful in that regard. Uh, and NATO is, is weakened these days. And it was just a day or two before uh, he made his unfortunate remarks um, about Macron, where he announced that he was cutting his contribution to NATO, uh, at the same time telling NATO that, that the countries of NATO, they weren't, they weren't providing enough. So he's putting, he's, he's on that track about putting pressure on NATO. Uh, this is not good for NATO. Uh, and, and ultimately, I think it weakens NATO. Uh, so Macron yeah. may have it in his mind that Trump is no friend of France right now. Yeah. He must be, he must be concerned about Trump and NATO and the continuation of NATO. 
After all, it's a mutual security pact. Uh, and to the extent that NATO is weakened, to the extent the EU is weakened, and Trump, Trump has hurt them in both departments, um, you know, that, that, affects, that affects, affects France's uh, security. Um, so, I, you know, I, my sense of it, I'd like to know your thoughts, my sense of it is that um, Macron and maybe a lot of French think that uh, Trump is not their friend as a country, uh, that Trump is weakening them, weakening the EU, and weakening NATO, and that is against their national interest. Um, yeah, no, I, I would agree all around. I mean, in general, there's not, not, nothing that can, you can find that is going to be positive from their side. But now, again, from, from the strictly America first view, so what? Uh, the French and the U.S. have always had this awkward, tense uh, love-hate relationship. Uh, that's always been a challenging one. Um, you know, when, uh, when Americans often think of France and, and this very stereotype, what is it that, what are they known for? Well, haute couture and perfumes and French, you know, uh, food. Uh, and by contrast, the Germans, which are, you know, another of our major allies in the U.S., uh, uh, you know, what do we associate them with? Obviously, you know, machines and, and, and strong, um, and, and yet, uh, you know, France has been there, as you noted, from the beginning of the nation as, as an important uh, supporter uh, in the Revolutionary War and the, and, and the following, uh, you know, uh, expansion with the purchase, the Louis purchase, et cetera. But uh, again and again, we would see this, and, and part of it is a, a clash of two, in some ways, two big powers or two big national interests. But the French are one of the few countries, perhaps outside of the UK, who, who can say that they 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 can project sort of a almost a universal, I don't know, uh, values, or, or or they can project power beyond their borders. Uh, you know, as a major civilization, as a you know, key part of the European, you know. Story and and founders of the EU and all of that, um, and so they, they have a vision or a view that's pretty clear of themselves, and it's, and it's you know uh, it's one that they don't hesitate to articulate. Uh, but it often comes in class with the U.S. And, and we often use this term in the, end of the American literature, American exceptionalism, right? That the U.S. has something special over the years. Uh, that I think is coming under a lot of criticism now, given given the the way the U.S. has played out under under the Trump administration. It hasn't won. Any new supporters, except for those kind of authoritarian leaders, whether it's the Hungarian president or or Turkey leader or Kim Jong Un, you know the dictators that he likes. Uh, unfortunately, for the rest of particularly Western Europe, uh, he is he is an embarrassment and and, and remains the you know the laughing stock. Absolutely, I, so I think they see it that way. And and one way that they seem to be pushing back um, is this group of six six countries within um, the EU. Um, have organized a, a special exchange uh, to buy Iranian oil uh, in, in uh, violation of uh, Trump's uh, oil sanctions against Iran. They haven't yet, as far as I know, actually bought the oil, but they've organized and they plan to buy the oil. And one of those six countries is France, as you would expect, because they're really uncomfortable with Trump's action. Uh, in, in ripping up the contract with Iran, ripping up the agreement, um, and, in, yeah. in, and then in telling them they shouldn't buy any Iranian oil, which certainly affects their oil market. Uh, don't you think that's yeah, part yeah. of this? Well, yeah, it's all filled into that, of course. And, and, and that, you know, not only that, but they're, they're, they're removing the U.S. from the Paris Climate, uh, climate Accord, the Paris Climate Accord, um, uh, and, and the the partnership and the Asia Pacific region, uh, overall a rejection of the U.S. of this notion of multilateralism and, and maybe of globalism more generally, uh, but a sense that, uh, you know, the European allies cannot count on the U.S. anymore. So there's been an erosion of that, an abdication of American leadership. Um, and much of it has to do more with the individual style of the president, not so much that he's got a vision that's clearly defined. Uh, I mean, he's got a sort of a version of nationalism, but... Uh, you know, he says one thing in the morning and then contradicts himself by midday. Uh, there's just a sense that he doesn't know the basic uh, rules and norms of, of governance. And uh, and also that, you know, something like this fight, of, uh, the fight against terrorism with ISIS. I mean, look at the contradictions there, basically selling out the Kurdish allies, then rambling with, you know, incoherency that, well, they didn't help us in World War II. They weren't there enormously. It's like nothing to do. And so it's just a total lack of... Uh, of basic, basic knowledge uh, that, that any, you know, reasonably educated person would just know, uh, and he just demonstrates 
no lack of that. Uh, so, uh, again, it, it is a laughing stock, and there's no other way to put it, uh, the shaking their heads. Uh, and yet, there, you know, here again, it's there, there, there's going to be some minority of the sort of hyper nationalists too who see the U.S. standing up for itself and, and not, you know, not somehow, you know, kowtowing to, to these other pressures. Because in parts of Europe, too, there's a lot of criticism of the EU, criticism of any and every government, of course. But uh, nevertheless, I think it's a, it's a sad day for the U.S. because here we were, you know, uh, the last 75 years, you know, major, you know, players in, in, in global politics and, and and while doing something saying for some, we've really just seen a total erosion of, of American leadership under the current administration. And, and you know, will, will the damage be so hard that it won't be possible to come back? Well, or, that's, or a, that's a really yeah. big question. Really, really big question. Because, um, you know, the damage seems to be increasing. The damage is like, like uh, having yeah. a more profound effect. Um, and it's not just the leadership in France and other the other countries in the EU and, and NATO. It's the people, you know, this sort of thing, this kind of entity has a way of filtering down to the, the man on the street. And all of a sudden you find yeah, that yeah. the whole country is now having, you know, a, uh, having a negative experience with the U.S. They don't feel the same way about Americans and all that. So my question to you, Carlos, and you've, you've spent many years uh, on Fulbrights and the like in Europe, um, is this is this repairable? Uh, in other words, if, yeah. if Trump doesn't win the election here in 2020, or if he's impeached, uh, or if he serves longer than you know another four years, um, how 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 can we come back? Can we come back? Can we restore, repair our long-term relationship with France and some of these other countries in Europe? Yeah. Well, you know, again, yeah, no, there's no easy answer to that. I, I think. You know, on one hand, there is a, one could say, you know, an enduring quality or part of the U.S. that is going to be there well after he's gone. Uh, and maybe another way to put it is that I think some, you know, uh, let's say uh, responsible and, and, and important people have the ability to separate this individual president who they're leading now and maybe the American people or even, for that matter, let's say uh, professional uh, bureaucrats or diplomats, because, uh, as we even saw in those recent petition hearings, I mean, if you came away with anything, that there are a group of dedicated civil servants who are there, regardless of president, who, who exemplify the best of the U.S., and we saw many of those recently testify. And what I want to say is that, you know, let's say a foreign ministry official in France, they know that there are some people in the U.S. State Department and government that they deal with who are knowledgeable, know their history, know their protocol, all that, and that instead they can distinguish that leader. But now, can the damage be repaired? I mean, it's hard to say, because on some level, uh, any change is going to be better as we'll help bring it back. Gosh, I'm forgetting that it's a transition to a pence presidency that I'm not testing. But uh, I think with Trump, we've just seen the worst of everything in terms of the insulting and, and the sort of total lack of uh, I mean, for the United States to have a leader who just doesn't understand the, you know, the most basic uh, and, and, and uh, whether it's uh, history, whether it's just you know that these are complex issues, or more importantly that. You, the world faces a lot of global problems that cannot be solved without cooperation and coordination, including terrorism. And, and so decisions that the U.S. makes in, in the Middle East or, you know, its actions uh, trying to build support or, or, or coalition or some other activity. If, if there's not a trust uh, in, in, in the president, he won't be able to get uh, any support. Mm -hmm. and as much as he may think it. The U.S. cannot go it alone on everything. You know, if we're facing, oh. uh, again, ex external threats, we need cooperation from other governments. Yeah. Uh, and uh, increasingly, I think there is a real this, this leader is, is you know, not to be trusted or understood. And, and, and you know, if anything, they, they've learned how to deal with him because now what he says or does is not at all surprising. It's like, here we go again. Every single time he's come to one of these multilateral meetings, uh, we see the same story again where he's, Kind of like the odd man out, awkward, um, and uh, but you know it, it will. If there is damage done, that will be hard to somehow yeah, you know. Yeah. Well, well, you know, one thing is that some some people have come to the the view um, that he's doing all of this without really caring about Europe. What he really cares about is yeah. playing to his base. Uh, assuming yeah. that, that his base is, uh, you know, supports isolationism, uh, which is really so inappropriate in our time. Um, but he's playing yeah. to his base, 
And, um, what, and what this is, is a reaction to the impeachment. Lest we forget, the impeachment is going on full throttle in Washington. <clears throat> and he wants a split screen on this, as, as was put yeah. in, in that article of, uh, in the Times. Uh, he, wants, he wants to counterbalance and distract people uh, from all the news yeah. about the, you know, the, uh, the impeachment. And so, you know, my, my question to you is this, you know, do the people in Europe, I mean, and, and I think most people that I know understand that. They understand that he's distracting. Mm -hmm. This is, again, just as he's narcissistic, he's also a distractor. Um, and, yeah. and so he's trying to distract everyone from what's going on in Washington uh, and put himself at the yeah, top yeah. of the agenda as usual again. But do the people in Europe sure. understand this? Do they understand well enough that this is a distraction for the benefit of his political base in the United States? Yeah, and here again, we say the people, I mean, I want to say the average person probably does not. They just see him for what he is, an obnoxious bully, more of the same, you know, the worst of the American, um, you know, just nothing new, but just a deeper level. But I will say, I mean, I think for many elites and maybe other more important, I mean, there's, there remains a lot of confusion and uncertainty uh, about uh, the fact that he's taking, you know, impeachment, which is uh, a potential removal of office. Now, the, the under three years, most of us are anticipating uh, uh, the House will pass articles, but the Senate will probably not convict. But what I want to say is I don't think it's that clear to others outside of the U.S., both because it's a confusing process. Uh, and so because it's not clear, there's a lot of uncertainty. There's a lot of uh, maybe um, legitimacy or credibility crisis where it's hard to take him seriously when at the same time you see that he's facing such a pressure back home. Then there's the puzzle that in the parliamentary system of Europe, someone like him would more easily be removed by, you know, legislative maneuvers that can force a vote of no confidence. And, and you would not see in most of the European places a leader like Trump. Now, that's not to say there are not authoritarians, the Victor Orbans or, or, or others, even Berlusconi many years in Italy, who have managed to capture the system, kind of, you know, put it behind him. But yeah, at least for a major power, you know, you in Europe, they're baffled with how, how could this person still be in office? How could he have even gotten to the office? Uh, and now that he's there, I mean, how can we take him seriously if, if there's so much of this pressure going on at home? Uh, but yet, having said all that, there's also a realization, well, guess what? He is the president. We've got to deal with him. So they've had to come up with their own sort of talking points for how do you manage it? Well, it's a problem you, for you them. To, but I think yeah, at the bottom, easy. Carlos, and we'll have, to, we'll have to close on this, but at the bottom... Um, if I were living in Europe, if I were a European leader, I would have uh, much less confidence that the U.S. will come to my aid, that the U.S. will understand yeah. and support me, help me in my national security, my, my regional security. Uh, I would be very concerned. Yeah. I would be confused. and sure. I would have this kind of anxiety about the dis disappearance of my old buddy, the United States, and the, yeah. Um, yeah. the confusion as to whether it will ever come back. Uh, you know, you're on yeah, your own, no, boys, no. And, and that's not a good place to be. Uh, anyway, no, Carlos, we have to follow this. Uh, I so enjoy our conversations. Yeah, yeah. I look no, forward we'll to the next one. Thank you so much, Jay, and we'll keep you, keep you posted and look forward to the next chance to keep our conversation going. Thank you, Carlos. Carlos Suarez. Okay. Take care. Aloha. Aloha. Take care now. Bye-bye.